people's Grenfell. He is the voice in that struggle for the people of Grenfell. Introduce you to Loki. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So what I wanted to talk about and firstly sometimes I feel that when we um, posit the idea of the rise of the far right, what we kind of invisibilize is the extremism of the state, as Nisha Kapoor puts it, 21st century state extremism. What we sometimes put the state in the position of being is a neutral arbiter in these kind of disagreements um, among the populace. The way I would look at the right of today is you have five layers of it and they have a symbiotic relationship with each other. So uh, the first part of it, we see and have seen recently the way the deep state is able to manufacture consent for the further taking of civil liberties from people. The war on terror has meant that essentially habeas corpus has become meaningless in certain contexts for people that are racialized as Muslims in this country. We've seen people um, detained and deported without ever seeing evidence held against them. But importantly, the deep state cannot uh, pursue these changes in law and these, these uh, taking of civil liberties that have taken place without the Murdoch and Rothermere media. Not only when Darren Osborne uh, did the, the operation that he did, he was searching for Jeremy Corbyn, he was searching for Sadiq Khan, he was searching for Lily Allen, but he settled for some Muslims outside the mosque and he directly quoted a headline from the Sun newspaper. So what is the role that Murdoch, in, as far as the Sun, in, ter in terms of the Times, what they did with Shamima Begum recently, what is their role in, in, in creating this kind of architecture of enmity that exists? Then another layer of this, uh, of this nexus, we can say, is the Tommy Robinson more street fighting, but also um, uh, social media uh, crusading groups. But where is their money coming from? Tommy Robinson has not become popular organically. He's become popular thanks to a huge, um, huge resources have been invested in amplifying what he has to say. Um, and the point that we must always be clear about is this is the most indicative part of this as a top-down project. It's not bottom-up, it's top-down. And it actually, the reason, despite the fact that it has had all of this money invested in it, it does very little to contradict what is people's lived reality, what is the conviviality and, and the general cooperation within which people live. He's giving them an opposite version of affairs. Now, I don't normally put a lot of uh, stock in anything Nick Griffin says, Nick Griffin says, but if you look at an interview that he gave in 2012, he spoke about around the time of the financial crash, being approached by people from the United States who said to him, look, we will back your purpose as long as you direct all of people's grievances with what is about to happen in the financial crash towards Muslims in Britain. Now, it's, it's his words, not mine, okay? He claims Tommy Robinson accepted that money to essentially launch a distraction project away from people's grievances with the neoliberalism, with the privatization of the treasury in this country, and, and towards Muslims. And he says Tommy Robinson accepted it, and he didn't. Those are his words, you can check out the interview for yourself. But he really provides a really essential part of this uh, of layer in this, uh, in this nexus. Next you have the think tanks like the Henry Jackson Society. And really not enough has actually been done at looking at how they are able to uh, with, with pseudo-intellectual, non-peer-reviewed studies create the foundation and the intellectual basis upon which people are able to launch their Islamophobia. Henry Jackson Society, none of them have a history of, of, of peer-reviewed studies, but yet they are accepted absolutely non-critically by the mainstream media and the BBC as somehow uh, authorities on Islam. But we're going to look a little bit more into the Henry Jackson Society and what their aims are. Next, you have Paul Goldie and Britain First. But you cannot separate them from Jacob Rees-Mogg. Something people did not uh, really comment on when it happened is when there was the action against Jacob Rees-Mogg at Bristol University, 
Paul Golding, prior to his incarceration, went online and said, if you shut down Jacob Rees Mogg, we're going to find out where you live and shut you down. Now, that's quite extraordinary because you have uh, a member of the Conservative Party almost having a street fighting faction volunteering, volunteering to act as mercenaries for him. Um, and of course, you have Boris Johnson, Steve Bannon, but also, and essentially, when we look at where uh, they are looking to take Brexit, they're looking to take it to no deal, deregulation, Trumpistan, uh, neoliberalism on steroids. You have the Institute of Economic Affairs. Kay Andrews is hosted on the BBC, more than actual employees of the BBC. And why is that? Because she is pushing relentlessly this um, agenda of deregulation. And so actually, it's all related. It's not, it's not an organic process which is happening in spite of people in power. It's something that the, the state actually has a, 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 a role in and has a symbiotic relationship with. If we look at Amber Rudd, many people will look at her policies and not see that, you know, she has sat on the political council for the Henry Jackson Society. Um, for many, many years, and she was only withdrawn from their website when the Canary um, uh, website started challenging her and emailing her about it. It's fairly recently. Um, you have uh, David Davis, Priti Patel, um, also uh, um, uh, linked to the Henry Jackson Society. You also have um, uh, Michael Gove linked to them, and it's led, you know, by Douglas Murray, who was ubiquitous a few years ago, but still is all over the place, really. And he, you know, this is a direct quote from him. He says, it is late in the day, but Europe still has time to turn around the demographic time bomb, which will soon see a number of our largest cities fall to Muslim majorities. It has to. All immigration into Europe from Muslim countries must stop. Sanctuary would be given on a strictly temporary basis. This should also be enacted retrospectively. <coughs> he then says, that people who um, happen to have parents that were born elsewhere and have a problem with British foreign policy should be repatriated to the places that their parents were born. Now, what do we make of it that the leader of a think tank that's putting out this stuff has people in the government sitting on the political council of it, has, them, has their ear and is able to uh, proselytize them you know, Liam Fox has spoken at Henry Jackson Society events. Um, if you looked at Henry Jackson Society's signatory, signatories to its uh, uh, mission statement, you would have uh, Parliamentary uh, Defence uh, Committee Special Advisor Paul Beaver, you'd have Jamie Shear, NATO Deputy Assistant Secretary General um, for Emerging Security Challenges, you'd have Rupert Murdoch's former um, right hand man, Erwin uh, Steltzer. You'd have um, Richard Dealer, the head of the MI6, um, in the run-up to uh, the Iraq war. That sounds like the deep state, does it not? That sounds like exactly who we're talking about when we talk about the deep, the deep state. Former di uh, CIA director James Walsley. Um, so essentially, you have the atmosphere created where, as Gary uh, Young pointed out in a Guardian article recently, three attacks on Muslims per day um, seem to be being committed in this country and he is using for that the Office of National Statistics um, uh, to look at that. And when we look at how this symbiotic relationship plays out, you have the funders of these think tanks who all come from the 1%, who, you know, a proportion of them have an interest also in the building of Israeli settlements in uh, contradiction of UN Resolution 242 um, and our Paragraph 6 of Article 49 of the Geneva Convention, also funding at the same time think tanks um, that work on creating the ground for Islamophobic thinking. Um, and these paid persuaders then produce these studies and feed them to the mainstream media. The, the tax exile media oligarch run news outlets then produce these things completely uncritically as if these think tanks have no interests. Um, and of course they're opaque about who actually funds them. And then the media, in conjunction with the think tanks, lead letter writing campaigns 
So one of the most important um, cases that I don't think we paid enough attention to was Abu Hamza's case. What happened during that time was you had the Daily Mail organize a letter writing campaign to David Blunkett demanding that the law be changed so this man could be um, uh, deported to the United, extradited sorry, to the United States where he could be prosecuted without any um, serious due process. And what happened was these billionaires backed the letter cam uh, writing campaign and David Blunkett was then see seen to be conceding to public pressure. And this is the game that is played out again and again and again. And we have seen it recently with Sajid Javid. You know, you cannot step, you cannot separate the violence of the state from the development of the idea of hate, you know, transferring hatred of Muslims, which was essential for the war on terror, to hatred of Muslims, which is essential for scapegoating them um, for the consequences of austerity. Those things are deeply linked. You know, Katie Hopkins, her education was paid for by the British military and intelligence, and she studied at Sandhurst. The only reason Katie Hopkins is not in the British military is because she has epilepsy. That's the truth, that's her words, not mine. Um, you know, you look at something like Schedule 7 Terrorism Act uh, 2000. If you're a Pakistani man, you're 150 times more likely to be stopped under that law. Now, ostensibly, it doesn't discriminate against people, but 78% of the 500,000 people that have been stopped under that act have been um, ethnic minorities, while they only actually constitute 14% of the population. So where is, it's almost like the invisible racism of the state goes on and feeds at the same time the street movements that we're talking about today. We're talking about the stripping of people's citizenship. It's not the first time it's happened. You know, since 2002, 53 people have had their citizenship uh, revoked with 37 of them, um, according to the data that is available, had origins within Muslim countries. Of course, it was the 2014 Act that allows them to strip the citizenship of somebody who doesn't have citizenship elsewhere, but could um, conceivably claim for citizenship in another country. Um, and it's the extension of terror policing and borders into the sector of the landlord, into the position of the employer, into the position of your doctor, into the position of teachers in schools. When we're looking at um, the channel diversion program, you have seen over 2,500 children under the age of nine referred to the channel diversion scheme as part of PREVENT. Now, that is for things like wearing a badge which says Free Palestine. That is for things like being critical of British foreign policy. Or one child even saying they live in a terrorist house. And the teacher misunderstanding it. I mean, this is really serious totalitarian <laughs> stuff. But it's like Gramsci had the idea of the active consensus, but this is a passive consensus which has gripped this society. You know, you have had children as young as three years old be referred under PREVENT and under the Channel Diversion Program. Now, what role is their racialization playing in that? That's an important question for us to look at when thinking about this. You know, and when thinking about the EU and Frontex, 34,000 people have died trying to get into Europe across the last two decades because of Frontex, because of that EU agency. It's, it, unfortunately, the goalposts have been moved to such uh, a point when it's almost as if we're fighting to maintain. That, that is the sharpest end of racism that we're talking about today, the people who are drowning in the Mediterranean. If we were to sit here and try and read out their names, we'd still be going for nine hours. That's the extent to, to which this is a, a serious problem. And so the point I wanted to make, uh, really to wrap up, if I'm right, is that your chances if, of dying from a terrorist attack in this country are 1 in 16 million. However, studies have shown that 120,000 people have died because of austerity. Therefore, statistically, you have a greater chance of dying from austerity than you do from terrorism. When we think about the, the, the violent action, which was the cutting of 350 youth clubs since 2010, the cutting of 343 libraries since 2010, 300 million pounds cut from uh, the youth service, millions of pounds cut from education. These consequences are real. And we share the grievances that people have with those consequences. We just blame different people for it. 
that's the key part of it. There's been, there's been, there's been, there's been a, a direct policy to take what they know. 77% of the public favour um, taking uh, energy into public ownership. 76% favour taking the railways into public ownership. 83% of this country um, support bringing water into public ownership. There is common sense support for the policies that we believe in. But the difference is, is a scapegoat has been cultivated in order to distract people from looking in the direction where the responsibility truly lies. And it is our job to correct that misconception and put it right. Thank you very much.